Coming up next, I'm talking with Jeffrey Morris, writer and visual futurist. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm Lisa Tabor, co-host with John Forty, while Mike Wassenaar is on sabbatical. Today I'm talking with Jeffrey Morris, writer and visual futurist, and co-author of Slingshot. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you for the, being uh, here. Chance to be here. Yeah. So tell us, what is a visual futurist? A visual futurist. You know, um, there's actually a, a, an artist uh, based in Hollywood that I like a lot, a guy named Sid Mead, who uh, uh, he did very influential production designs for movies like Tron, Star Trek The Motion Picture, on and on, Blade Runner. And it's a term that he coined, visual futurist. Oh. He's actually a, um, a guy that is, I was lucky enough to made, meet his acquaintance a few years back. And uh, you know, it it's really has to do with taking what we know is coming in the future, look, looking at projected technology, design, uh, uh, industry, also looking at science, engineering and then uh, extrapolating it and trying to create visuals and uh, uh, imagery that really uh, resonate that uh, you know usually for a Hollywood production film production in, in our case uh, um, a soon-to-be film production but uh, uh, initially a book okay. so, yeah. and you named um, an, uh, uh, a designer or Actually, a creator uh, yep. of Tron and, and yep. whatnot yep. what other movies might we see visual futurism Just, in? you know um, uh, Films like I mean, any any film that takes place in the future, okay. that that requires production design in order to pull it together, you could have someone like a visual futurist who's doing the the, the design work for it. And yeah, is so. there then? It sounds like is there's a sense of reality behind that design work. Certainly, in in the case of the work that I'm doing, you know, I, I mean, it's very very important that it's scientifically accurate and that it function from an engineering standpoint at least within 90 percent of possibility. Really? Sort of yeah, yeah. Okay. That's not typical, and, uh -huh. and there, there are a lot of times if you look at something like the Star Wars films, they're they're more about what looks cool, you know, what 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 will look really neat on screen versus mm -hmm. would it really work in in actual real life? Sure. You know, so. Or will it work in real life in a hundred years? Yes, exactly, <laughs> like exactly. I mean, if you if you think about something like yeah, actually, like something like Star Wars is a galaxy far, far away, so yeah. and a long time ago. We're talking about the actual future. So okay. you're you're absolutely right. The iPad would be an idea. Um, you you go back in time. 10 years, if you were to transport an iPad back in time, it would be uh, almost magic, mm -hmm. literally. You know, it's like, how does that work? How does it function? But somebody was thinking about the ideas that, it, that uh, the elements that came together to create an iPad or an iPhone initially and then an iPad. That kind of and thing. so that's something that you do a lot. Absolutely. Thinking about yeah. these ideas. Can you yeah. tell, sort of walk us through your process a little bit? Where do you get your inspiration? And oh, wow. Um, well, in the case of uh, my book here, uh, Slingshot, that I, I put together with a great group of people here over the last couple of years, um, it's a, it's a sci-fi story that's set about 90 years in the future. So for, in the case of something like Slingshot, what we're dealing with is, uh, um, oh gosh, we, we look at, I do a lot of look every day. I'm, I'm always looking at online at uh, different engineering sources or science websites or different places to kind of learn about uh, what's out there, what's coming, what, you know, what's on the drawing board. Um, then I also have to kind of think about, well, what are the cultural, political trends? You know, what are the environmental trends? What are all the sort of things, you know? And it's very hard to predict the future, obviously. There are many people who, if you were to go back in time 50 years ago, people would have thought we'd have, you know, space stations and yeah. cities out there on the moon and all sorts of things. And we don't have that. But what they didn't, it's very interesting. If you look, though, they, they predicted all those big, grandiose things. Mm -hmm. But what they didn't predict were things like cell phones and iPads and you know so it's very interesting it's almost like we went in this direction that was more about technology mm -hmm. um, and everyday conveniences you know, you know flat panel televisions <laughs> and things like that yeah. as opposed to these big grandiose societal pushes you know that sort of thing but uh, that said you know the research that I do is really about trying to look at the future and trying to figure out what could possibly happen you know mm -hmm. there's some there's some pretty um, you know certainly there are things that that we know 
are coming. We, we know that people need more and more energy. We need more energy all the time. And there's going to be a big, that's a big dilemma in our book. Mm -hmm. where, is, where is the energy going to come from? In our case, in our book, they go to Jupiter to get the energy in the form of hydrogen, you know. And, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's this dilemma. Look at what's going on in the Gulf right now and those sorts of things. I mean, you know, there's, there's choices to be made and decisions, and those were, that's really what looking at the future is all about. Right. In, in all likelihood, we're going to be completely wrong, but it's, it's certainly fun <laughs> to speculate. something Yeah, better, something's right? going to be there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, it's, and it's fun to speculate. It's always fun to speculate. And so, so. you spent a lot of time, a lot, years, in fact, um, developing slingshot, mm -hmm. the concept and mm -hmm. the um, design work and the storyline and everything. Let's talk a little bit about it. Can you sure. show? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is, this is, is, this is slingshot. It's a 160 page illustrated screenplay. And uh, what we basically have are, uh, there's a lot of uh, beautiful design work. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we've got, you know, speaking of future, here's a scene that I did of uh, uh, kind of a corporate headquarters in Arizona in the future. And there's a, uh, there's a futuristic helicopter there, you know, sort of thing. So, but there's all kinds of, this is like kind of almost like a tour of the future in a lot of ways. But there's, at its core, there's also a dramatic narrative and action adventure and that sort of thing. And what I really wanted to do here with this was create a story that, um, it's almost like looking at something like, I, I looked at Star Wars, my, my writing partner, and I looked at the film Star Wars, and we said, okay, uh, Star Wars in some ways is almost doing a disservice mm -hmm. to science. While people enjoy Star Wars and they really like it a lot, there's a, there's a big difference between, um, what actually happens to travel in space versus what we see in science fiction films, mm -hmm. right? So what we decided to do was tell a story that was as, as action-packed and adventure-oriented as Star Wars, but to keep it realistic, right. you know, and to say, okay, how well as close to realistic as possible, right? You yeah. know, so so instead of uh, you know having lightsabers and magical devices and the force and all this stuff, we said, all right, what what a, what would you really use propulsion to travel across the solar system? Where would you really go? What kind of things would happen to you once you get there? How would you survive? You know, what are the dangers? All those sorts of things. And so we really constructed a story around that. And we also worked pretty heavily with NASA. Um, you know, my, my company's been a subcontractor of NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, mm -hmm. California, for a number of years. And uh, so we were aware of what goes on in the space missions, and we had access to scientists and engineers and astronomers and people to talk to. It was very cool. And Buzz Aldrin. And Buzz Aldrin, Who yes, Buzz actually Aldrin, wrote yeah. the foreword for the book. Yes, Buzz yes. Aldrin wrote the foreword for a book, and mm -hmm. we've, we've had the privilege, privilege to be able to work with him. And, um, and it, you know, it's very interesting because he, uh, um, it kind of ties together because Buzz, actually he feels that sci-fi actually does a big disservice to real space exploration to a large degree mm -hmm. and part of why he endorsed our book is because he felt like we successfully melded the realities of science with the um, kind of the needs of an action adventure fantasy story. Mm -hmm. you know, so what does it mean then for you to have a hero like Buzz Aldrin oh, endorsing yeah. the book oh, and working yes. with him? Unbelievable. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. You know, and, and we've been able to continue a working relationship with Buzz here for the last few months also, which That's is, wonderful. yeah, yeah, what a, what a cool guy. And, you know, just to, um, you know, to, you know, he walked on the moon. I mean, that's, you know, there are only, what, only 12 men have done that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the idea that, uh, you know, that the accomplishment that, and the, the knowledge and the understanding that it required for him to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So it was a real honor to be able to tie something like a project that was so dear to my heart and the heart of my, my partner and the others that we worked on with, you know, someone like Buzz. Mm -hmm. So it's very cool. Very, yeah. very interesting. Um, yep. And the story you were talking a little bit earlier about um, embedding some realism mm -hmm. into the storyline. There, there is reality in that. In the uh, price of uh, fuel, yep. it's not gas. Actually, yep. what is it? In this story, mm -hmm. uh, well, we're actually using hydrogen uh, as a as a fuel source. Basically, the 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 issue is that uh, you know people talk about hydrogen cars nowadays. Like we should get hydrogen cars. We should, you know, the problem is that you you would um, hydrogen in its natural form basically uh, sort of drifts away from the earth. It has mm -hmm. a tendency not to, you know, gra it's lighter than, than air, so it drifts away. The idea, you usually have to make hydrogen, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that to make the kind of hydrogen we would need in order to, um, to power our civilization, you'd actually be using more fossil fuels and, you know, without a renewable source to actually create the hydrogen, you, you, you create it by splitting water from, you know, the oxygen and the hydrogen, and you, you'd collect the hydrogen, right? Mm -hmm. And then you'd burn it as fuel. 